Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Cash Factory. Um, I'm Wesley O'Hara from Music Alley again, and today I'm going to be moderating this panel on the power of video. And what we're really going to focus on today is kind of how video has been changing the music industry and how it's been changing creative work all around the world. So from governments to artists to producers to recording artists, all sorts of different things have been happening. Um, we're going to do a quick introduction from each person, so let's kick it off. Thanks. Uh, I'm Alex Kish. I'm general counsel and EVP at Vivo, uh, the world's largest uh, premium music video platform. I've been with Vivo since its beginning in 2009. Uh, prior to that, I spent time at MTV Networks, uh, Sony Music, uh, BMG, amongst other places. Um, I oversee uh, our, our licensing work and our distribution, uh, amongst other things. Emma? Great, hello, my name's Emma McGann. I'm a pop singer-songwriter from the UK, uh, and I use live streaming every single day to connect with my audience. Uh, they come and they watch every single day, and they pay to do so, and uh, I'm earning a full-time living from that, and have been doing so for the past four years. And Nicholas? Hi everyone, Nicolas Soyas Malinier, uh, CEO of uh, O5 TV on OKLM TV to television network, broadcasted in uh, about uh, 100 te countries, and um, that's it, I guess. My name is Carlos Perez, I'm a graphic designer and director. Uh, my company's name is Elastic People, primarily work in the Latin space. So I think to start off the conversation today, we're going to open with the subject of revenue. A lot of the times when we hear of YouTube, Vivo, other platforms, a main conversation that we hear creators caring about is making sure everyone gets paid money to their bank account. Not just that they get credit for it, but that it actually happens. So I think, Carlos, can we open with you and say, hey, oh, ha, oh. Carlos, as the creator of Despacito, the director of the largest video ever viewed on YouTube and probably in ever human existence. Um, what kind of situations have you encountered as a director that still has gaps in the value chain of creating a music video? I mean, I think it's, it's not a mystery for anyone that's in the video industry that um, we're basically work for hired out. I mean, it's a one-time payment. Um, you know, it's... Uh, I learned to be positive in a sense that, you know, companies like the the YouTubes, the Vivos, and many other platforms at some point are going to look at content creators, not only the artists, but the producers and the directors, and somehow bring them in into the equation down the road. Uh, Alex, I think you've been with YouTube since the beginning. How has kind of the licensing scenario around YouTube uh, Vivo changed, and how can we expect that to maybe change in the coming years? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. The, the licensing hasn't necessarily changed that much. So there's been tremendous amount of growth. Um, you know, for us, we really focus on two things: um, delivering promotion, you know, getting building audiences for artists, and driving monetization. That has been our mission since day one, um, and I think we've you know, been pretty successful at that. We've, we've taken a business which really was a cost when it started all, not that long ago and created a business that's, you know, a billion plus dollar business today. Um, so, I mean, and, and I mean, to Carlos's point, I, I, I have a certain amount of sympathy. Um, we're sort of systematically, I guess, um, you know, we, we license the vast majority of what uh, we distribute from labels, from middlemen, from aggregators and distributors. Uh, we do produce some original content, although a lot of it itself is done as work for hire for the labels. So we're, we're also caught a little bit in that same um, structure. I always thought the VMAs, it was a, an odd thing that the artists got all the credit for the videos that people like Carlos created. Um, so it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see as video becomes a more important currency, quite literally, um, whether we do see some change there and, and the directors and creators behind the videos start to maybe move a little bit more toward the center, both in terms of their 
their uh, sort of notoriety and credit, but also from a monetary perspective. And I think it's I think it's pretty interesting when we talk about that. We also see there's a difference in the way a songwriter versus the way a recording artist, the person whose name is on the record and visible to most people inside a streaming service, is credited as well. And we can kind of see a parallel with the creator of a video, whether it's a work made for hire or otherwise. We usually aren't going to know who made a music video, whereas we know who directed a famous feature-length film. And we know who acted in it as well. So I think there's a lot of space left for different creators to also have a lot more profile and strength around their different er areas of their brand. So Emma, when you started streaming with you now, had you streamed with other platforms before? Uh, no, so I kind of organically grew on you now. About four years ago, I started using it. I had a moderately small uh, fan base that existed already on YouTube, um, but I wanted to grow that. Um, so you now was certainly a way of doing that. I'd never heard of it before. Um, and in a matter of months, my fan base had grown, grown tenfold. Um, and about four months in, they brought monetization into the platform, w which was an additional plus for me, of course. Um, but in terms of that fan base growth, it was really something. What are the uh, what are the different ways that monetization in you now works for a creator? Uh, so it works. Uh on a kind of tipping basis. So the best way to kind of describe it is like online busking. Um, partnered broadcasts can earn, and the audience, if they choose to, they can tip. It's totally free to watch. Uh, there's also a subscription feature where they can subscribe uh, for $4 a month or something like that, and they get certain perks uh, to kind of interact with you more and become more visible in your broadcasts. And you've mentioned that you've been looking at different streaming services as well to go live on. So can you tell me about a little bit the different revenues that you see from those? For sure. So um, the same uh, company has released a new uh, live streaming app very recently. It's currently still in the beta stage, and that's called Rise. And the difference with Rise is they're now allowing not just content creators, uh, but the audience as well to earn in cryptocurrency. So that's a very interesting, uh, inter interesting avenue for them. Um, they've launched their own coin, which is coming later on this year. Um, but not to get too technical about that, but currently I think people can earn in Ether, so there we go. And Nicholas, so you work really extensively with 360 videos, and what kind of different licensing, what kind of different work or revenues do you see around 360 videos that you produce versus different types of videos that you may have done in the past? Oh, it, it depends a lot of the um, of the artist, of, uh, of the platform, I mean, um, I would like to say, as an owner of television, first of all, when we receive a music video, the first thing, we, we listen to your music. And then after that, we, I think the, the image is a added value to the music, because you might, you might receive a song, it's not really good, but if you have a, a good music video, a good image on it, I think at the end of the day, you like more the song than before. And, uh, Mm, what can I say? Um, it, it means a lot to get a, a good video for the music for me. So, I mean, is is there a difference that you see in different territories, for instance, as well, for how 360 content gets engaged? Yeah, so we are broadcasting in France, in Africa. Uh, right now, we are dealing with China Mobile to be broadcasting in China. Uh, we are broadcasting also in Canada. So when we receive a music video, it, uh, it's it's very uh, large exposition. We can get them, oh. we can get for the artist, uh, we can reach a large audience, I would say. Sweet. Now, Alex, I think, are you able to tell us a little bit about the growth of Vivo in the last couple of years? And, of course, there's also the change with the Vivo site and Vivo app being discontinued. Can you speak to that for a minute as well? Sure, happy to. Yeah. Um, well, from, from a growth perspective, um, you know, it, it's just been exponential year after year. We were talking before, but I just happened to look back today and see three years ago, uh, we were at 11 billion videos a month, which is a, a crazy number. But today, we're at more than twice that. We're typically doing... That views a month. Views a month globally, yeah. So between 23, 24 billion views every month. Um, in this past quarter, we, we did 676 million hours of video, which I determined equates to 77,000 years. So 77,000 years of video watched consecutively just in the first quarter of this year, and it, and it just seems to have no ceiling. So how does the, how does the average watch time per user of something like Vivo change? Um, we're, we're seeing it 
uh, continue to increase. It depends on the platform. Uh, so television, uh, connected TV, maybe not surprisingly, has the longest engagement times. Uh, mobile tends to be a little bit more snacky, so people are watching kind of in their spare moments and may watch a video or two, whereas when they're sitting down in front of a television, they're, they're leaning back, which is actually a good segue to your, your other questions. So, um, in terms of the changes um, as of yesterday, with our sunsetting of our, uh, our mobile apps and our uh, website, uh, a lot of that was, so we're, we're, we're continuing to build out on uh, various connected TV platforms and see that as being a real area of growth, incremental to what we're doing on YouTube. So YouTube continues to be you know, a tremendous partner with unprecedented uh, you know, engagement time and, and, and growth there, and we're you know, more focused than ever on, on uh, growing our YouTube presence, because at, at 24 billion streams a month, if you can grow it even 5%, that's pretty material. But we, at the same time, we see incremental uh, opportunity, especially on the television screen, uh, through over the top or through uh, other means there. So, you, Can you just summarize to the audience what OTT is, please, over the top? Uh, so anything from an Apple TV or a Roku or uh, an Amazon Fire, any of those boxes that you, you don't actually have to have a subscription to a cable company or a satellite company, but if you have an internet connection, you can watch programming through apps. Um, and there's a whole uh, world of virtual MVPDs in the, in the process or haven't been launched in the last year or so which are showing a lot of growth as well. A lot of them owned by those same cable companies and satellite companies, but trying to find ways to uh, capture cord cutters. Um, so we see you know, just a, a bunch of different opportunity there in, in the living room. I think we're, we're pretty agnostic mm. in terms of the, the means we get there, but we think there's a lot of opportunity that's truly incremental to what's happening on YouTube. Cool. And Nicholas, do you see similar trends with the way you have a TV provider and also alternative types of video. Do you see different types of engagement based on what type of video it is, based on what device it is, and what kind of extent does that happen as well in different territories? I think uh, internet platform on the television networks uh, works good together because sometimes when we broadcast uh, an upcoming artist on, the, on our television, uh, we can see uh, the growth of this view on YouTube because we put uh, a lot of effort to to um, to broadcast uh, um, unknown artists and uh, to give an example, we we were the first TV channel in France to broadcast uh, Chaldish Gambino. We know this is America artist. I may have heard of it. Yeah, but we broadcast it since six years, seven years ago. So La Casa Proki, Grand Eclama, a lot of that, and. Um, uh, the way we work in France, it's uh, um, international artists don't have maybe the position they have in their local country, like uh, like I said, like Chili Gambino before. And uh, the way we, we broadcast it in France, uh, we can see the, the result on this video on YouTube. We can see the result when the artist is booking in France, in Africa. Etc. Yeah. Now, Carlos, when you are directing a music video or another project, what different media do you tend to take into mind? Do you think of the TV? Do you think of Instagram or Instagram stories? Or is it just that kind of YouTube screen most of the time now? Well, I mean, I, I'm a graphic designer as well. So naturally, I, I, tend to, um, I tend to look at a music video as the seed of... 20,000 different applications. Um, obviously, nowadays, there, there's, we are, you know, I tend to find myself thinking as we are um, conceptualizing a, a music video, in what ways the content generated in those 12, 14 hours can be maximized into the Instagram into the Facebook, into the media exclusives that the labels do. So yeah, I mean, when we look at the music videos now more than ever, we're, I mean, the music video almost turns to be like 10% of the final product. Yeah. So yes, we, I've been, we look at it across platform in every which way. That's amazing. What kind of, are there, are there any media that really have started getting more considered? I imagine vertical video because Instagram stories has exploded. Yeah, I mean, yeah, when you, 
you have Spotify being extremely aggressive with the vertical video, which I think is going to be a fucking nightmare. <laughs> because realistically, it's like as a director, you have a 14-hour day to really produce, you know, whatever video it is that you have concepted. Then on top of it, they want us to look at what we see horizontally into a vertical space within those same 14 hours. So realistically, I think they're just shooting themselves in the foot. Um, but it is what it is. You just have to react to technology. And have you, have you seen different perspectives from other uh, either streaming services or creative platforms that you've worked with specifically? I mean, look, the Instagram is yep. extremely... Uh, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time on it. You know, it's like... Now, the, the deliverable beyond the music video, we're, I tend to like to control the set and the content that gets put out. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at not only the music video, we're looking at the, the media interview with both artists that are collaborating. We're looking at the behind the scenes. We're looking at a still photo shoot. So simultaneous within a 14 hour, you're looking at, you know, from still and static content to, you know, content that's gonna interact simultaneously. Primarily on Instagram is really mm -hmm. the, the one that we're really so wh where is the music video going to be in six months? Is it going to be on your phone and Instagram? Is it going to be square? Is it going to be horizontal, YouTube style? What's What do you think the creative is going to evolve to or continue to be? I mean, more, more and more so it's becoming an integral part of, you know, the music industry. Um, I think it's... I think what's how it's going to evolve, at least from a as a director, I tend to. I've been doing it for 15 years. I don't. I've never based my model into volume. I've only done 80 videos in 15 years. So if you divide that up by year, it's like five or six videos. Um, I'm still a very selective director. I like to hear and engage with the songs that I identify with. Um, so where is it? <sighs> I don't know, man. It's so changing. <laughs> it's so changing. Um, it's, it's, I think as directors, we're, I'm inclined more to looking at what kind of musical content beyond just the music video are we going to be able to go in? Is it a documentary? Is it, is it a, a feature film based on an independent artist? collection of 12 songs? Mm. Those are the kind of businesses that I'm looking for in the future because we want to own a little piece of the content we create. Yeah. So I'm trying to go as far away from the music video soon. Cool, wow. Now, Emma, when we talk about back to you now, um, you mentioned you go live every single day. How long do you go live? What usually do you do? How does the audience engage with that? And how do you keep or increase engagement over time? So I go live uh, usually between one to three hours a day, but it's usually just one hour a day. Um, and that's literally every day. The content varies. Uh, I'm a musician and a songwriter, so my prime uh, reason I'm on that platform is to share my music, uh, but to also really interact with that audience. So I've found to kind of really keep that watch time up is to make sure that they're in as involved in the broadcast as I am. Um, it's very, I guess it's very different from like a YouTube video where you sit back and watch and take it in and you're inspired that way. With um, um, something like live streaming, um, you haven't you have the ability to have an imprint on what's happening in that broadcast. So um, they can type comments to me and maybe send me song requests, or I'll say, hey, throw in a random word and we'll try and create a song off the top of our heads and see what happens. So um, in terms of um, the content, it's all very varied uh, to keep the interest there as well. Cool. I think we're we've seen quite a few uh, platforms obviously try to introduce live video and then maybe de-platform it a little bit. So things like Instagram Live usually has incredibly low engagement. There are accounts that will go live with two different accounts live at the same time. Um, so viewers are watching both of them. These can be accounts with over a million followers and you'll see under two, 3,000 people tuning in. Um, are there any platforms that you've tried and just haven't worked all that well yet um, as far as live streaming goes? 
Um, like I say, I've organically grown my fan base on you now, so I've been quite native to that. Um, I would say uh, in terms of driving that audience uh, to other platforms, it's been an incredible tool. Um, for example, a Kickstarter campaign we did last year, um, I wanted to fund an album and it was very successful down to you now. So we raised, I think, 21,000 and that was through driving that traffic through a call to action button that would drop down on my broadcasts and then they'd go and they'd, uh, and they'd discover the Kickstarter campaign. So uh, in, t in terms of like uh, translating the audience across, it's great, but other kind of uh, social platforms that have uh, integrated live streaming isn't something I've explored because I'm, I'm very native and I love you now. It's, it's yeah. a different, completely different thing. Yeah. So with, with live streams, there's probably a different level of engagement and growth to your audience that you'll get based on consistency. But I think, uh, Alex, can you tell us a little bit about how does a blockbuster music video change Vivo or change a platform or change, you know, the, the music industry in the context of music? And let's, let's maybe use Desposito as the first example. Yeah, I mean, in... Any, in any number of ways, right? I mean, talked before about, you know, video becoming sort of its own currency, and it really has, I think, um, morphed from, you know, what was uh, a piece of content created in the service of an album. It was a promo piece, and it's really becoming now, it is itself um, the centerpiece often. Um, and the, the, the attention and for, um, major videos as they come out are their little cultural moments. I mean, they are, and, and this is something as we look to monetize, this is the case we make quite successfully to advertisers every day that, you know, week to week, um, we release a video by whether it's a, a Desposito or it's a Beyonce video or a Bieber, there will be a global superstar with a video that will end up in a very short amount of time with, you know, over a hundred million views. We did a study with Nielsen a little while ago to try to put that into context of television. And basically the question was, if music videos were television shows, how would they rate? How would they compare to the most popular shows on television? And what we found is, week in, week out, they would rival the top three shows. And some weeks they would be equivalent to the number one show in the United States. Is, is that based on total watch time or is that based on, yeah? Yeah, watch time and engagement, number of unique viewers. Um, obviously, they're not you know 22 minutes long, but in terms of attention and, and viewers, and uh, so it, it's it, it's incredibly powerful. It's an incredibly and, and those metrics and the premieres themselves as a product that we bring to market from an ad supported perspective are are incredibly important and become uh, often a centerpiece. So we will build media plans around the release of these very large videos. Now with, with, you've mentioned video is now its own currency. It used to be a bolt-on thing to support the song itself, but I think there are different parties who want a piece of that currency and want to be able to spend that currency. So, Carlos, can you tell us a little bit about how governments and other entities have been using music videos at this point? Um, I mean, it's a, in Latin America, as an example, um, it's definitely, I mean, Despacito, it was proven that the searches online to book hotels and buy flights went up like 42% a month after this pasito sort of became global and, and viral. Um, so from that instance, I recently did a Ricky Martin video in Puerto Vallarta that was funded by tourism. So more and more we're seeing how the music video turns into a platform to impact the culture and the tourism of a country. And, um, you know, I've, it's happened in Argentina, it's happened in Mexico, it's happening all throughout Latin America. And it makes sense. I mean, if you look at what tourism used to spend in regards to shooting a commercial, buying the media, now for a very small percentage of what that expenditure would be, and by calculating how many, how many fans a Ricky Martin with 10 million on Instagram and so forth, you know, that engagement is priceless. And it comes at a very small fraction of what they would typically spend on a normal tourism campaign. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an incredible offline reaction result. I mean, imagine doubling or one and a half times in your area's tourism simply by having it be in a music video. And also that music video is quite large. Now, Nicholas, is there any kind of like similar projects that you've gotten where maybe 
uh, somebody wants to say, how can we leverage video specifically in France or any of your different uh, um, primary regions? I, I lived uh, almost the same thing than Carlos. Have my, one associate of mine, his name is Booba. He's a famous artist in, uh, in France. And uh, we did a music video named Dick Dicaer in Senegal. And uh, after that, we have been uh, reached by the Senegal government to come to the country to do more videos about uh, about Senegal, and uh, that's the way it is. As uh, as uh, Carlos said, now you can see uh, government tourism uh, company uh, f um, raise money to to make come the artists in their country and do a music video to promote their country. So. Uh, as far as the, the genre of music that this tends to work with, I mean, Carlos, obviously you've Latin. What kind of genre are you looking at, Nicholas, for this? Uh, can you repeat the question? What kind of genre specifically have these, these types of videos been for in your cases? Uh, what type? Uh, it was more um, hip-hop music videos, uh, pop music videos. We're working with K-pop artists in China right now, actually. Mm. Uh, because uh, beside of O5 on OKLM TV, I'm also a music producer. So I produce, I produce music videos for artists. And um, yeah, so... It's very global uh, today. So I think um, I have a bit of a question for you again, Alex. So when we look at Vivo, and we've just heard about K-pop, we've just heard about Latin, what else has been happening differently within the Vivo ecosystem kind of on a genre level? Yeah, actually, so for the first time in, um, you know, I guess the <clears throat> eight plus years we've been up and running, we've seen this past quarter hip hop become the number one uh, genre surpassing pop. I mean, it's always been a strong, strong genre for us, but, you know, pop videos have been the ones getting the most views. So, you know, interesting. Um, and, and Latin as well, you know, we see huge growth on um, Desposito and sort of its wake and um, just, you know, a string of huge Latin hits globally. Um, we've actually had to kind of change things up structurally um, and have, you know, add additional people to or specifically focused on programming Latin, both uh, sort of with a focus for U.S. Latin as well as uh, focus on Latin in, you know, various other uh, markets throughout Latin America, which, you know, you have to kind of look at each one uh, a bit differently. So Mexico will be different than... U.S. Latin, then Brazil, and, and, and so forth. So if we're looking at this last quarter um, and that change as well, who's kind of leading this? I'm guessing Drake's and Gambino's and et cetera. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, it, it, it's the big blockbuster videos, but I think it's, you know, it, it's a trend overall. We have a very long tail as well. Um, so, you know, in any given week, there's like a thousand different videos that come through. So, but certainly, yeah, I mean... Um, Drake's been huge. The This is America video was the fastest um, video to, you know, broke our one week record with over, I want to say over 80 million views in 10 days. I may have the number wrong, um, but big. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> a lot. Um, Emma, I think you've mentioned how when you're supplementing revenue from simply the you now live streams, um, you kind of utilize the Kickstarter. Uh, what other kind of ways have you seen your Unit live stream spill over to different sources of revenue? I mean, do you, how do you have a website set up? Do you have merch available that constantly drops down for purchase within your streams? Um, so yeah, I host uh, a merch shop on my website where I sell, sell physical uh, albums. I obviously release music digitally as well. So um, there's always an opportunity to drive the traffic to, to Spotify and to iTunes and, and wherever. But um, for me, um, merch is a huge thing. Um, and if you don't have, a, if you are a musician and you don't necessarily have a merch store and you 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 have the audience get a merch store, like it's a huge huge revenue stream that I don't think. Uh, enough musicians really take advantage of, I feel. Yeah, I mean, when we look at YouTubers, if you go to a YouTube office, there's often a YouTube shop, which is gonna have like bobbleheads of famous YouTubers, or famous YouTuber merch, or Minecraft merch. All of these different licensed properties, whether it's licensing somebody's image right or something else, directly for sale in a partner 
point of sale, the, in the actual point of sale of the platform that they have. Um, now, Facebook and Facebook Live is something that as a platform has really been trying to double down on bringing people into Facebook offices, go live from Facebook, have a good studio behind you. Um, Emma, what kind of different live streaming platforms, I mean, has you now ever invited you along and said, hey, do you want to come do a live stream from our office? How's that going to work? Sure, yeah. So um, you now are based in New York, uh, and they have uh, select events throughout the year um, for all, all of the broadcasters across the site. Um, they have put me forward for awards, kind of nominations, iHeartRadio Music Award last year um, for a Social Star Award and also the Shorty Awards. Um, so yeah, there was one uh, year, maybe two years ago, they invited um, me over for, I think it was the Shorty Awards, and I had a single release coming up, and we hosted a single release party, and we live stream from the offices. And because my audience is so used to seeing me perform in a studio back at home, um, that kind of uh, new environment where I was actually at you now, and uh, people were able to kind of see the team and see see that you know it's not just a platform, it's a, it's a team of people behind it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, that was really special. But yes, we do uh, different events like that. Cool. Do you happen to have an idea of how like your peak concurrent viewers of a video correlates to clicking through traffic to either a store or to Spotify or anything else? Right, so what we usually do is we set up a bit.ly link so we can monitor all of this. Um, so concurrently, um, some of my broadcasts usually range from, um, I would say, 70 to 200 people at any given time. Uh, and that usually racks up, if I'm live for an hour, uh, usually racks up maybe 5,000 views per, per broadcast or maybe more. Um, so we kind of do see that traffic um, through um, to my own website uh, via bit.ly which I would recommend using if you don't already, or smart.url for um, sharing your links to mu your music as well. Yeah, cool. Um, I think that's an interesting point that you have as well. Like the concurrent view viewership measurement is something we don't think of. Like how many people are watching Despacito right now? That's a question that, uh, honestly, I don't know how it's going to evolve, but Alex, how do you kind of think Vivo could evaluate different versions of analytics based on you know, is it views in a day? Is it views in a minute? Is it ever going to become a metric of success when somebody's getting a high volume of, of views per second and that per second view or per minute view or something crazy like that becomes a new metric? Do you, have you guys talked about that? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think we're, we're that focused on per seconds or per minutes yet maybe, but certainly, I mean, we look at velocity overall, right? So um, we certainly look at you know, do uh, how, how quickly are views being sort of ratcheted up in, in a day or in a week? Um, I, I think we're actually focusing a lot more now on sort of views are, are important, but we're, we're starting to focus a little less on views and a little bit more on actual engagement time, mm. whether concurrent or not. And I think the idea is not every view is equal. Um, and when, and you, when you say engagement time, can you just tell the audience how that would be measured? Just, I mean, you know, if, if you're watching a video and you click on the video and you watch the first two seconds and leave, that could be counted as a view versus if you click on the video and watch the full three minutes. So the latter to us, you know, is quantitatively different. Um, and even if it's, you know, counted as a view and monetized that way, and actually, since so much of our activity happens on YouTube, and YouTube has made some changes recently in their policies, right? So in terms of how you rank in their algorithm, um, which is important if you want to come up in not only search, but in um, as they recommend videos when you're watching a video. So the more you are, uh, if, if you're a video that has a very short view times and you have a lot of clicks, but the clicks are for two seconds and people leave, YouTube will actually um, you know, mark you down. It will actually hurt your chances of showing up in their algorithm. And in a way, if you think about it, it's, it's trying to um, uh, discourage clickbait type of uh, videos that maybe pull you in, but there's not really a lot of interest in it. And that's something we think about is, you know, we, we create a fair number of original videos ourselves, performances, interview pieces, and so forth. And so that's something we're looking at very closely uh, in terms of how do we even create. And so we see if there's music in the first few seconds of the video, 
that's going to bring people in and keep them there. By the same token, if we have a live performance that we've, we've licensed, um, and there's a long intro of an artist telling a great story, well, on the one hand, that's great if you're a super fan to, to hear that. On the other hand, we see statistically a lot of users will turn it off, right? If they don't sort of at least start, even if you start with music, then go to a bit of an interview piece, you'll have them kind of pulled in. But if someone sees something and is just talking, they tend to kind of bail on it. That's, that's really important. Carlos, have you interacted with any different kind of like creative staggering of a video, like exactly as Alex was just saying? Uh, like open with something, then go to something, go to something else for different types of you know, directional elements? I mean, there's the art of music and filmmaking, and then there's the business side of yep. music and filmmaking. You know, when you, I tend to bounce around, come up with a middle ground. I still think, I still am happier on the artistic side of filmmaking. Obviously, the business side is now driven by analytics and numbers and so forth. You know, I remember when YouTube exploded, it was giving filmmakers the ability of creating pieces that were long and more cinematic because on the network, anything beyond four and a half minutes, it was gonna get cut off. Mm. So there was a trend that you would see Lana Del Rey videos, they had, beautiful introductions. Now, the whole opposite, you know, you do this beautiful thing and the label first thing out of their mouth is they're gonna click away, cut it, get rid of it. So that ends up being like a trailer on Instagram, for example. So, yeah, I mean, we, we tend to embrace the analytics, but, you know, I try to stay on the yeah. heavier on the artistic side of things in order to create things that are, you know, organically engaging versus mathematically correct. Yeah, I think there's been a, there have been a couple different uh, recommendations that platforms have provided, and there's this one from a blue branded social media platform uh, owned by Zuckerberg, uh, and basically they've started saying to some teams at labels, hey, 75% of your views on Facebook come from, you know, videos that are two or three seconds long. Therefore, you should be investing 35, sorry, 75% of your budget into videos that are two to three seconds long. And that clearly doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't take for what, what the qualitative difference of each second of a view is. If I watch 10 seconds into a video, the, you know, it, the, the first two seconds of that are not just going to be an indicator of, oh, wow, I've seen two seconds of this video. I'm definitely retained because it's counted as a view. Instead, you kind of think of how the reason that happens is when you're scrolling through your Facebook newsfeed or when you're scrolling through your Instagram newsfeed, how long does it take you to scroll from top to bottom or bottom to top? It takes you two to three seconds. So it's kind of an idea of if you're simply trying to get somebody to notice what your video is in a social feed, then making sure you have something like branding and music and all of those different ideas in the first two to three seconds makes a lot of sense. But doing that in a way that doesn't interrupt the art, as Carlos was saying, that's, that's a very fine balance that we're still gonna have to work with. Um, now, Nicholas, what kind of different ways have 360 videos in particular kind of assisted you guys? Mm, us, um, we don't look at the, at the views yep. to, to, to program a music video. First of all, we have a, an artistic side. As said, Carlos, uh, first I watch to the quality of the video before to, to watch the number of views he has on YouTube or, or any platform. Because as I said before, we, we, we are looking for the, that the, the main goal of 05, we are looking for the artist of tomorrow. So, uh, who will, not the artist already uh, in ink in the business, you know. So, we 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 don't watch we don't watch the views, uh, but it's true when we receive a, a music videos, we watch a five ten second. If it's not really good, we we sweep it. To be honest, so. That's why we say the power of, of the videos is really important mm -hmm. in the music industry because it's, 
it shows your work, your artistic work. Yep. And we have a, a major print on that. Yeah, and of course, different platforms have different ways of measuring things like a 360 video. So if you upload a 360 video to YouTube, you can actually see a heat map of the points at which people are most frequently watching. And that can help you understand, hey, if I'm making an experience that's meant to be directed or experienced in this 360, 360 degree way, how successful am I actually being with the visual cues and the audio cues and all those different factors as well? That's, uh, that's all the time we have for the panel. Uh, thank you, everyone. You can go meet the speakers upstairs afterwards if you'd like. Take care.